guys, it's your girl from Philly. Welcome to the very first episode of Handcrafted Wines, where we make great wine at home the fun and easy way. Before we get started, please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and click that notification bell so you don't miss any episodes. Today on Handcrafted Wines, we're going to discuss the basics of wine fermentation or wine making basics. Um, the basic equipment that you need when making wine at home, as well as the basic ingredients that you'll use for each and every batch. Before I get into wine making basics, I'd like to give you some background on how I got started making wine in the first place. Back in 2008, my mother-in-law at the time had a massive apple tree in her backyard. Every year, the apple tree would produce dozens and dozens of bushels of apples, and we never really knew what to do with all those apples. One day I had this bright idea that I was going to take some home and make a batch of apple wine. So that's what I did. I collected all the really good apples that I could find and I took them home in a big crate. I washed them, cleaned them, prepared them and put my apples in the freezer until it was time to use them. Then I went online and I did some research. And the very first thing that I purchased was this book the winemaker's recipe handbook. This was my Bible when I first started making wine. The second thing I purchased was a five gallon fermentation kit. Now this was before the age of Amazon. So it took about two weeks for me to get everything, but I was so psyched that I was going to be able to try my hand at making wine for the very first time. So I had the idea that I'm going to, because it was harvest time, make something that was similar to an apple cider. I wanted to make a spiced apple wine. So I bought cinnamon and cloves and nutmeg. I purchased my sugar and my yeast and everything that the, the handbook told me that I needed to make wine. But I didn't use the amounts in the amounts that I was actually instructed. I thought, you know, a little extra sugar would make it a better wine. A little extra spice would make it tastier. What I didn't realize is you need the amounts of what you use for a reason. So my end result was very, very awful. <laughs> it was the worst wine ever. Um, the color of the wine was a thick, brown, muddy mess because I didn't really know anything about Clear, clearing your wine, um, the process of clear, clarification when it comes to wine. The body of the wine was kind of like a light syrup, which is not what you want when you're making wine. It was very um, cloyingly sweet. The other problem was I used way too much spice when making my wine. So the taste of my wine was very bitter and sweet at the same time, which was not a good combination. So needless to say, my very first attempt at making wine at home was an absolute failure. But I learned some things. Even though it wasn't a good wine, it was wine. I was able to take apples and process them into an actual alcoholic beverage. So I learned from that. And over the years, I've gotten really good at making wine at home. And that's why I'd like to share it with you. We can make some fun wines together. So the very first thing that I'd like to do is talk about the equipment that you'll need when making wine at home. And it's not as much as you would think, um, but it's some specific things that you do need. The very first thing that you need, the, the most important thing that you need is a way to sanitize all of your equipment. Um, inside this bottle, it, I have what's called star sand solution. Now you see bubbles inside the bottle, but there's no soap in here. Star sand solution is an acid-based sanitizer that on contact will kill any microbes, bacteria, or wild yeast. That's also very helpful in preventing any type of foodborne illnesses that could come from having contaminated equipment or contaminated fruit. So your solution is number one. The second thing is a place to make your wine in. This is a glass fermentation vessel. 
for the purpose of this channel, I'll be using one gallon glass fermentation jars. You can also use fermentation buckets and they come in one gallon size, three gallon size, and five gallon size. In my description, I'll put some links in there for different size kits that you can get. But just so that we can see everything that happens during the process of fermentation, I chose to go with glass for this channel. Our glass fermentation vessel will have a basic lid to it and it will be drilled with a grommet on it. The purpose for having a grommet is for our second piece of equipment, our airlock. Our airlock prevents um, two things. It allows the CO2 that our yeast produce to escape out of our batch, but it also prevents anything that we don't want from getting into our batch. Our wine will do two different things while it's in the stages of fermentation. One, we're very interested in happening. One is it makes alcohol. The yeast eat the sugar that's in our must and it produces alcohol, but it also produces some gas. And this makes sure all of that gas or the majority of the gas gets out during the fermentation process. The second thing that we would need after our first stages of fermentation is a secondary uh, fermentation vessel. I've been following Charles on DIY fermentation for some years now, and there's an ongoing debate on whether this is called a secondary fermenter, a carboy, a jug, um, a demijohn. There's so many different names to call this particular um, piece of equipment. The most important thing is, is that you have one. Along with it, you will have a bung. The bung will fit tightly inside of our demijohn or a carboy or our secondary fermentation vessel. And then we will also replace our airlock in here. Okay. Now in our primary fermentation vessel, I'm gonna go back to primary. One of the things that I always use, but it's not necessary to use. Many people make wine and they don't take this step, but I like to use a straining bag. When I'm making wine, all of my solids will go into my straining bag. So if I'm making blueberry wine, all of my blueberries, if I'm using lemon peel, my lemon peel, if I'm using tea bags, my tea bags, everything that's solid will go into my, my straining bag. When my wine has finished fermenting, I'll remove this bag out, give it a slight squeeze so that any residual wine that's in the bag comes out. And then the contents of this bag, I dump because this was food for my yeast. It's no longer good for anything but to throw away. Everything that would be left inside of our, our fermentation vessel would be wine. But again, it's your choice. There's a lot of people who put all of the fruit in along with the, wa the water and the sugars and they just let it go at it. I prefer to use a straining bag. Now, the way that we know how much wine we're producing when we're making wine is through this device called a hydrometer along with this device, which is our beaker. When we're measuring our specific gravity or our bricks, we put up to 250 milliliters of our wine must or our solution of fruit, water, sugars, and anything else that we put into our wine into the beaker and we'll put this inside. It will be buoyant and it will settle on a number. The number it settles on will tell us what our starting gravity is or our bricks. Our starting gravity um, will be the number that we use to determine after we finish fermenting what um, our alcohol percentage is. And the way we do that is as the yeast eat our sugars, your bricks or your gravity actually goes down. So we'll subtract the lower number from the higher number to determine what percentage of alcohol we've actually made. Now, you have wine at 10% ABV or alcohol by volume, but that would be a very, very weak wine. The target that you'd be going for is anywhere between 12 to 14%. Even 15 to 16% is not a bad number. However, higher numbers don't necessarily mean better wine.
I played around with a fast acting yeast once and I was able to get to 20% ABV and the product that I made was actually terrible. I tried it with sugar and made like just a sugar water wine and the taste was horrible because more alcohol does not mean better wine. Our goal is to have a balance of five things when we're making wine. We want a, a balance of taste, of body, of clarity, of tannin, and of bouquet. All five of those things should be balanced in order to consider yourself having made a good wine. Now, here's some other things that you'll need in the process. You'll need measuring spoons because once I go over the ingredients, you'll understand why. There's different amounts of all of these ingredients that you'll have to use. You'll use a measuring cup. Typically, I've gotten accustomed to when I make a one gallon batch of wine, I usually use between two and two and a half cups of sugar. If you look at some other channels, you'll see them measuring out the sugar based upon their um, gravity reading of their hydrometer, and they'll measure it based on pounds. I don't get that detailed. I pretty much suck at math. I've come, become very comfortable with the two to two and a half cups being the amount that would make a really great wine for me. If I know that the fruit that I'm using is a very low sugar fruit, I may go as high as three cups of sugar, but that's rarely necessary. The other piece of equipment that I always have is just some type of bowl. Now I could be using fresh fruit or frozen fruit. Very often I use frozen fruit just because fresh fruits are only in season. You want some place that's sanitized for everything to defrost and be ready for when you're ready to make your wine. And the one thing I meant, forgot to mention is the way that we get our sample into our beaker is typically a turkey baster. Um, there's a longer version of this baster that's sold online. I have yet to get one, but I eventually will. Now there's just two more things. And one I hardly ever use. And for some people, this is bad winemaking. I don't use a masher when trying to mash my fruit. I prefer to use an immersion blender. The reason why is because the immersion blender does exactly what this does a lot faster and it breaks your food down a lot more. Some people look down on using an immersion blender because they think that it makes it difficult to clear your wine. I rarely have any problem making my wine clear and I don't really use a lot of clarifying agents when it comes to clearing my wine. So this is my choice. Okay, so we, we've covered the basic equipment. Now there's other things that you will be using in the process of making your wine after it is wine. You'll be using a racking cane, you'll be using tubing. There's things that you that we'll go over later when it's time to use them. I will now like to go on to our basic ingredients. I call my basic ingredients our, our usual players or our regular players. The very first thing, let me find it, is our Campton tablets. Campton tablets is a, um, an additive that you use when you're using whole fruits or vegetables. I don't think I, I discussed this. You can make wine out of fruits, vegetables, grains, herbs, teas, flowers. If it's a carbohydrate or a sugar, you name it, you can make wine out of it. We're typically accustomed to our wines being made from fruits, but I've seen some very successful wines being made out of greens and herbs and all kinds of things. So Campton tablets you use whenever you're dealing with something that hasn't been pre-sanitized. For instance, frozen fruit is sanitized because the process of freezing it makes it sanitary. But if you were to go to your local produce store and buy some fruit or pick some fruit at your local farm, you would wanna make sure that you treated your fruit with Campton tablets 24 hours prior to adding any yeast or any other additives to your batch. If you were to add yeast at the same time that you had added Campton tablets, you run the risk of either killing your yeast or stalling it from actually taking effect. So we wanna make sure this has an opportunity to dissipate in our batch before we go any further. Back to our usual players, acid blend. 
Now, again, this is one of the ingredients that some naturalists or some people who like to make natural wine look down upon. I'm not sure why, because the ingredients in acid blend are basically the same thing that you find in lemon juice. Um, it's just a little simpler and a little faster. And I like simpler and I like faster. But you may from time to time see me, instead of using acid blend in my wine, actually using lemon juice. For instance, when I make a butterfly pea flower wine, um, I'm, part of the ingredients is lemon. So I will make sure that I actually use lemon juice for both my acid as well as for the flavor. Um, the purpose of acid blend is to create the correct pH level in your wine. You should be halfway um, in your pH, on the pH scale, your wine batch should be mildly acidic in order for it to be a healthy environment for your yeast to thrive. And that's our goal. Our goal is to create the proper ecosystem for our yeast to thrive. And in return, they give us wine. Next to the acid blend, we have pectic enzyme. Whenever you're using whole fruits, I like to use pectic enzyme because its purpose is to break down the cell walls in our fruit to make it easier for the yeast to get to the sugars inside of our fruit. The result is a more fruitier wine as well as um, a more balanced wine. It has better color, better flavor, and you've used up more of your fruit when you've treated your batch with pectic enzyme. This can actually go in the day before as well. Um, it doesn't have to. I put my pectic enzyme in the same time I put my yeast in, but many people like to put it in 24 hours, allow it to break down the fruit before they add the yeast in it. The next thing is our dynamic duo. We have our yeast nutrient and our yeast energizer. Our yeast nutrient is diammonium phosphate. It actually acts like um, vitamins for our yeast. It keeps them healthy and it keeps them in good condition. The only We definitely don't want our yeast to ever get stressed in the process of making wine. Now, our yeast energizer is, is actually dead yeast. But what it does is act like an energy drink. Can I say Red Bull? It acts like it's a Red Bull. Um, if you ever run out of yeast energizer, a very simple way to make some is to go to the store, purchase bread yeast and boil it in a little water. When it cools off, that solution is the same thing that's in a yeast energizer packet and it works great. The yeast love yeast energizer. They just get frantically excited when you add it to the batch. The next thing that I want to mention is, I'm not gonna mention this yet. I'm gonna mention tannin. Tannin is that quality that gives wine that back of the mouth astringency, that mouthfeel that we want when, when drinking wine. Um, wines that are filled with tannin have an excellent um, mouthfeel. This creates that perfect mouthfeel. Some people who don't like using tannin powder prefer to use black tea. Black tea is loaded with tannin, so they work the same. So if you decide not to use the recommended half teaspoon of tannin powder, you can also use one teaspoon bag. <laughs> this is going everywhere. One bag of one one bag of tea. I don't know where I got the teaspoon from. Okay. Now, one thing about tannin is it's very, very difficult to blend. It cakes up when it adds to liquid. So that's another thing I use my immersion blender for is breaking down my tannin so it blends into my batch a lot easier. The last um, ingredient that I have is... No, nope. where is that? I just saw it. Potassium sorbate. Here we go. So potassium sorbate is an additive that we add after the fermenting process. And what it does is it stops yeast from being active. It doesn't necessarily kill them, but it prevents them from reproducing. So they eventually fall off. You would add potassium sorbate when you plan to back sweeten your wine, which is typically my method of making wine. There's several methods of making wine. Some people will um, start their, their wine and then stop it from fermenting when it gets to the 
a level of sugar that they want. I like to ferment my sugar until, it, I'm sorry, ferment my wine until it's completely dry. And then I add potassium sorbate and I back sweeten the wine to the flavor that I want. I typically like a semi-sweet wine. Some wines you would prefer to be a dessert wine and some wines taste better dry. It's just a matter of preference. So that's basically all the equipment and all the ingredients that we would use in our batch of wine. I'm hoping that you will join me and make wine along with me. A lot of this equipment is in, well, most of the equipment will be in my description um, and there's links there. So when you purchase them from Amazon, I get a little commission. So I, I'd appreciate it if you do. Oh, so that's really all the information that we have for today. Our next episodes will be actually making wines, which is, purpose of the channel and we'll be having a lot more fun but until then i want to thank you for spending this time with me again remember to like share subscribe help me grow this channel and thank you for spending time with me have a great day